Tom Gresham's Gun Talk. Gun law expert and author Alan Corwin talks national reciprocity. Plus, your questions, comments, and range reports. Call in now at 866-TALK-GUN. And now, here's Tom Gresham. All right, let's talk about some guns today. I'm Tom Gresham. It's Gun Talk. We're going to have some fun today talking about, well, you know, the guns I like, the guns you like. Maybe even guns you don't like. I don't care. We'll just knock it around a little bit. It is fun. We're having a bunch of fun. Uh, always do. We get to talk about, well, our favorite hobby, shooting, gun collecting, hunting. Uh, you know, just taking people out to the range and having a nice time. I don't care if you're knocking over 10 cans or you're shooting competitively, seriously, you know, compet- competition. It just doesn't matter. Maybe you want to break a few clay targets. If Here's something for you. If you haven't gone out and broken a few clay targets in a long time, and I think a lot of people maybe used to shoot trap and skeet, maybe a little sporting clays and got out of it. Why'd you quit? Do you shoot? Here's a question for you. Do you shoot less now than you used to? I would love to know if that's true, and if so, why? What are the changes in our lives that end up having us shoot less? Less than we used to, but also less than we want to. Because I cannot count the number of times I've said to somebody, well, you know, how much do you shoot? The answer is always, well, not as much as I'd like to. Okay, well, why is that? Is it a time thing, a money thing? a change in family, a change in demands on you, or, as I think happens fairly frequently, people move. We move a lot, those of us in the United States. And when you move to a new area, you tend to lose your contacts. It's one of the big reasons that people stop hunting, because they lose access. They don't have their friends. They don't have access to places. It just is hard to reestablish all that, because Often, finding a place to hunt involves many years in one place of getting to know people. It could be even a family thing. So if you shoot less, if you hunt less, I would love to know that. Our number is 866-TALK-GUN, or just dial one Tom talk gun We're giving away stuff, of course, as we like to do. we got a Brownells Get Retro giveaway. Well, one enter is going to win the new Brownells 16A1 rifle. It's a clone of the uh, M16A1. Pretty cool rifle. Looks like uh, a Vietnam-era M16, obviously uh, semi-auto. Very cool stuff. You go to guntalk.com slash win. Uh, that's going to end this, or it's going to end on Friday, February the 23rd. So you got to get moving on that one. Guntalk.com slash win. Let's see. You still have a few days to enter on another deal. This is the Springfield Armory Happy Valentine's Day giveaway. Uh, we've partnered with these guys uh, at Springfield Army. They're giving away a whole bunch of stuff. Go to Valentine Singular. That's singular. ValentineGiveaway.com. ValentineGiveaway.com. Enter for a chance to win uh, a bunch of stuff from Springfield Armory. 866-TALK-GUN. We'll get you in here. Uh, another question. Is this the year that you make some changes in your the way you carry? I got a note, by the way, from a friend this week. And at first, I, it almost made me mad, and then it made me puzzled. And it said, it started off with, I know you hate open carry, but it went on to some stuff. And I went, what do you mean? What? Where did you get that? I don't hate open carry. I choose not to do it for me, but if others want to do it, I don't have a problem with it. There are, I think, there are strong points to be argued on either side. For me, for my personal situation, I favor concealed carry. That doesn't mean there aren't times when I will open carry. But I'm not sure where that came from, the idea that, and maybe just me saying that I don't open carry, somebody took that and ran with it and said, yeah, well, you must hate open carry. No. It's always interesting to me when I hear people tell me what I said on the air. (laughs) When I didn't, I said, go back and let's do it again. Oh, yeah, okay, I thought you said that. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> let's see, Kansas lawmakers vote to let 18-year-olds have concealed weapons. People as young as 18 could carry concealed weapons, 
hand guns, under a bill advanced in the Kansas House on Thursday. Currently, people must be 21 years old to have a concealed firearm. Lawmakers rejected allowing Wichita State University and other public universities to prohibit concealed weapons. Instead, they voted to require permits for anyone taking guns onto campus. A lot of stuff going on. A lot of things going on in the states right now. And we'll be talking a good bit about that uh, as we go along. It's once again kind of reaffirms what I've said before. You've got to be involved in your state organization because that's kind of where the, the rubber meets the road right now. There's not much happening on the federal uh, level, although uh, in the next hour we're going to be talking about reciprocity. And there may be a problem with the bill making its way through Congress. There may be a problem with the content of it. We'll be talking about oh, what's wrong with reciprocity. Is there something wrong here? Is there something we need to change or correct? We'll talk about that. What would, and here's another question for you. What would it mean to you to have national reciprocity? Assuming you carry, you have a permit, you carry, and you travel, what do you do now? How difficult is it? What what challenges do you have to meet What process do you go through when you're traveling, when you're going state to state to state, and you want to carry? And have you run into situations where you have to go someplace where you can't carry at all? And so what would it mean to you is kind of the the, the end of it all. What would it mean to you for us to get national reciprocity where you could carry in every state using the permit that you have? And maybe, depending on how you read it, maybe even not have a permit at all. If you come from a state with constitutional carry, 866-TALK-GUN, or just dial me at Tom Talk Gun. I'm Tom Gresham. We'll be right back with more Gun Talk. For tactical equipment for military, law enforcement, and shooting enthusiasts, look for the name Elite Survival Systems, creators of high-quality, intelligently designed products for concealed carry, discreet transport, and rigorous tactical uses. Elite Survival Systems knows there isn't just one method of carry that works for everyone. Elite offers a vast array of concealment products to fit your lifestyle, including holsters, belts, vests, pouches, slings, bags, backpacks, and cases. Find out more at EliteSurvival.com. Since 1937, Ducks Unlimited has led the charge on wetlands and waterfowl conservation. Wetlands reduce the effects of flooding and recharge our drinking water. But perhaps most importantly, they allow us to experience what makes the outdoors so great. Band together to rescue our wetlands. Used guns can be a great value, but you have to know who you're buying from. What if you could buy quality used guns with a lifetime warranty from the Internet's largest online reseller? That's what you get at Dewey'sGuns.com. They stand behind every firearm purchase for life. If you have a problem, they'll either fix or replace your gun. Pistols, rifles, shotguns, and more. Check out their inventory today at Dewey'sGuns.com. Responsible owners control access to their firearms, even when they may need them in a hurry. Liberty Safe, the nation's leader in gun safes, offers six models of handgun vaults. Strong, simple to use, open with a key or fingerprint. Put your handgun in the compact vault, lock it away until you need it. Then it's in your hand almost instantly. Pick the Liberty Safe handgun vault that's right for you. LibertySafeHD.com. Okay, we'll talk about this in just a minute, but uh, news that just broke in the last day or so. Uh, Reuters News Service reports Remington Firearms seeks financing to file for bankruptcy. Yeah, a lot of folks in the industry have been kind of waiting for this. We've we've known what's going on there. A lot of problems, a lot of issues, and uh, tons and tons of debt. We're talking about $950 million dollars uh, you call it <laughs> we'll do a, we'll round it up it's a billion dollars in debt how do you how can you even service a billion dollars in debt 
I don't know that you can sell enough guns in the market to be able to handle that kind of debt service. And so uh, from Remington, uh, the story is, it says the move comes as Remington reached a forbearance agreement with its creditors this week following a missed coupon payment on its debt, the sources said. The company has been working with investment bank Lazard Limited on options to restructure its $950 million debt pile. Uh, Remington is seeking debtor in possession financing that will allow it to fund its operation once it files for bankruptcy. The size of the financing and timing of Remington's bankruptcy plans could not be learned. Um, You know, hate to see that. Hate to see that. Great name. One of the, I mean, it's Big Green. Come on, it's Big Green. How many of us grew up with Remington Firearms? That doesn't mean they're going away. But it means they're really in trouble, um, and a lot of people have known that for a while. I don't know what I don't know what your take is. Eight six six talk gun. Ray is with us on line three out of Tallahassee, Florida. Ray, you got a range report for us? What you got? Right, I uh, gave you guys a call last week uh, about the uh, the Grendel mm-hmm. uh, on some deer. So I just wrapped up the uh, last couple of days in Alabama for their uh, tail end of their deer season. I was able to uh, to bag a nice size doe. Um, I wish I had waited uh, just a little while longer because just as the light was running out, this big buck walks out, and I could not get him in my scope. He was, he was just a shadow <laughs> among shadows, and I was, I was very, very angry. But, well, um, you know, nothing you can do about it because, I mean, you know, if he comes out, it's too dark to see to, see to shoot. It just is. So that, that doesn't reflect on anything. Shot, yep. you, you, you couldn't have done anything about that. I mean, whether or not you shot the doe wouldn't have had any effect on that. No, you're exactly right. And, uh, I was thinking about what you said uh, on your last trip um, out out west. Uh, you know, the coolest part about all of that uh, that old trip was, uh, you know, we were hunting another property, and I was actually able to. Uh, we had the canoe into position uh, because all the logging <laughs> roads were flooded, the creek roads, and yeah. the only way to get in was uh, through a canoe. That was. Uh, oh, that's you know, cool. Never get to do that again. Super yeah. cool, definitely. definitely. That makes for, that makes for a great hunting story. Oh, definitely. I just wish something showed up, but hey, I guess they wanted to stay dry that day. Hey, let me ask you, uh, what bullet were you using for that uh, on that Grendel? Uh, I had a uh, 120 grain Federal Fusion. Um, it performed fairly well. Uh, I, was, I think I shot it probably about 50 yards. I mean, it's just, it is what it is in that part of the country. But uh, Sure. Yeah, it had a little pinprick entry wound and then a... Um, a very uh, respectable exit wound. Well, that's that's pretty good performance. I mean, and all right, here's the question. How far did the doe go? Uh, she might have gone in about 40 to 50 yards. She was on the edge of the plot, hit her, made an about face. She ran that distance in the some pretty thick uh, thick mm-hmm. brush. Uh, we had a, a, a pine straw floor, so it was pretty tough to track the blood, but, you know, I'm I'm only halfway to 60, so my eyes still work pretty good in the dark. <laughs> well, you know, and I will tell you, people say, well, you know, the deer ran off. I said, if it didn't run more than 100 yards, I count that as a good hit, a good shot, and good performance. I mean, you're going to get what you're going to get, and sometimes they might just fall down. But often it's that 40, 50, up to 100-yard run, and they'll pile up. And I just count that as being normal. I ex- Honestly, I expect that when I shoot a deer you got to be prepared for the worst, absolutely. Yep. Well, that is great. I am glad that the, the Grendel's working for you. Uh, what uh, rifle do you have that chambered in? Uh, uh, okay, what, um, it's the uh, it's a it's a Colt lower, and I took the 5.56 five, upper off and treated it like a golf club. Just dropped a uh, Sanders Armory 18-inch uh, stainless barrel. Uh, mm-hmm. It did have a Merkel brake on it. Um, I took another shot earlier this week, and uh, that brake... Uh, gave me a face full of bark. So if you hunt with the muzzle brake, don't have uh, that muzzle brake against a tree. You want it protruding back a little more. <laughs> oh, sure, because it's blowing all of that exhaust, that uh, muzzle blast out. If you got the muzzle right next to a tree, it's going to cut up that bark. So you got a face full of bark. I did. I cut, cut, got a small cut on my hand. But, hey, lesson learned, right? <laughs> well, I mean, no permanent damage, but as you say, makes for another great story. And I appreciate you passing it along. It's one of those things that 
people wouldn't think about, you know, because with a normal barrel without uh, a muzzle brake on it, you would just put it up there. You wouldn't think about it. But with that brake, sure, you're blowing all that stuff off. you got to make sure that brake is clear of anything. Right. My 3030 did not do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great range report, Ray. I appreciate that. And congratulations. That's uh, I know that's some good eating meat. All right. Have a good one, Steve. You take care. Yeah, 6.5 Grendel. Um, Ray had called last week, and he was asking, you know, what, what do you think of that? Honestly, I think probably out to, what would you say, 250? Yeah, you could push it to 300 yards, but probably 250 is a reasonable distance. Think of the uh, 6.5 Grendel as maybe just a little bit more than a 30-30. That may be, I don't, I don't want to uh, damn it with faint praise, but it's it's a good cartridge. It's okay. This is not going to sound charitable. It's plenty good enough. It's not a 300 Magnum. It's not a 270. But as Ray said, you know, where he hunts, 50 yards is about what you're going to get. I remember reading somewhere, hearing that like the average shot on Whitetail is far shorter than 100 yards. It's. You know, I, there probably are 10 whitetails shot inside 100 yards for every one shot beyond that. And I know we all want to talk about long range, and I got me a long range rifle and all that. And yeah, that's fine. But truth be told, most of these shots are pretty short. Now, now, having said that, and, and I certainly have been known to use something that has limited range, and that's kind of part of the fun. You got to get close. But there's also no reason to say, well, I'm going to go hunting, and I know that the average shot is under 100 yards. Well, what if your shot's not average? What if you do have a 200, 300-yard shot? I would suggest that a couple of things. One is have a rig that can handle that. That means a cartridge that can do it, a scope where you can hit a rifle that is accurate enough. And then we come to the hard part. (laughs) <laughs> the nut behind the butt plate, right? Uh, that'd be you. That'd be me. Making sure that we can do our part. So having a, a rifle, a cartridge, a scope, a package that can shoot does you no good if you can't hit the target when you need to from whatever position. Standing, leaning against a tree, watch that muzzle break. Uh, kneeling, sitting, prone, whatever it happens to be, all right? Just, um, you know. I favor, as soon as you get your rifle sighted in on a bench, never going back to a shooting bench. Because most people go to a shooting range and shoot their rifles from a bench. And yes, I know, there are probably a lot of ranges where you can't shoot your rifle from other positions. Well, try to find something. If nothing else, here's a, a drill for you. If nothing else, try this. And this is very effective, honestly. Uh, with a completely unloaded, double-checked, triple-checked, no ammo around, unloaded rifle. I like to do a thing like where I'm walking, and then as though I just saw a deer, bring the rifle up and aim at something. you got a small thing. Put the sights, or in this case, generally for me, it's going to be a scope, on the target, Flip safety off, press the trigger, and then hold, 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 follow through, and make sure that the crosshairs stay on the target. Do it again, but this time, if you're walking or even standing, and maybe even with the rifle slung over your shoulder, drop down to a kneeling position. Same deal. We're going to dry fire. Get on the target, press the trigger, and then hold to make sure that you see that the crosshair stays on the target. Follow through is really important. Drop down to a sitting position. Drop down to a prone position. Get back up. Do it again. If you do 10 of those, and you know what? Most people have a place. If you have a variable scope, you can crank it down to the lowest setting, two to three. You can actually do this inside. You can shoot across, shoot, that is, aim across a room and have a doorknob or something or target on the wall that you can aim at. Please triple-check that gun, make sure it's unloaded. Uh, And hold on that target and practice getting into a sitting or a prone or kneeling position or even shooting offhand. Do that 10 times a night. Do that 10 times a night for 100 nights. we got 1,000 practices, and it makes a difference. 
the more you pull the trigger, the better you get. And it doesn't have to be pulling the trigger on live ammo. Now, obviously, it helps to be able to do that. If you're shooting a bolt action, by the way, and let me emphasize this. When you shoot a bolt action, when you're dry firing or when you are at the range, it works like this. You get your sight picture, you press the trigger, it goes bang, you work the bolt, you get a sight picture, and you hold the sight picture. Every time you pull the trigger, you work the bolt. Bang, and you're holding on target. Bang, and you're holding on target. Every time. Well, why is that important? Well, a lot of times we shoot, and then we uh, kind of wonder if I hit. I look through my spotting scope, and then I flip the bolt open. Well, what are we doing? We're teaching ourselves to not be ready for the follow-up shot. And we're drilling that we're not going to be ready for a follow-up shot. When you're hunting, you shoot something, it falls down, or maybe even it doesn't fall down, and you get a second shot. But it may fall down, and it hop back up into or three, or four seconds. I've had it happen. A lot of people have had it happen. And if you go bang, work the boat, and you're holding right on it, if your trophy animal jumps back up, you're ready for the follow-up shot. If you make the shot and you miss, or sometimes you even hit, and it doesn't go down, work that bolt and ready to go. But you will only do that when you're hunting if you have done that with all of your practices. That's why it's so important to practice the way you're going to hunt. In self-defense, you're going to practice the way you fight because you're going to end up fighting or hunting the way that you practice. You're basically giving yourself a better chance at success at both of those things. 866-TALK-GUN. 866-TALK-GUN. Do you hunt or shoot more or less now? Sign up for our Gun Talk newsletter and join the Truth Squad at www.guntalk.com. Now, back to Gun Talk with Washington Times opinion page regular contributor Tom Gresham. All right, back with the 866-TALK-GUN. Get you in here or just dial Tom Talk Gun. Here's a guy who uh, said he bought a gun to protect his family. Then he saw someone beating up a cop. Yeah, Salt Lake City area. Derek Meyer, the gentleman's name, said that he was uh, driving on Main Street in Springfield, about 50 miles from Salt Lake City, when he saw the police lights and a man beating a police officer. It was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Said the officer had seen a pair of feet dangling out of a bin for a, a food pantry and stopped to find out what was going on. And this guy that the officer stopped to see what was going on with him, if he's okay, he jumps the police officer and just starts beating on him, and wailing on him. Well, Derek Meyer saw what was going on, did a U-turn, turned around, came back, he said, uh, I carry a gun to protect me and those around me, but primarily I carry a gun to protect my family first and foremost. He said, outside of that, if I were to use my gun to protect anyone, it would be law enforcement or military personnel. So, as I say, he, he did a U-turn, got out of his car with his gun, aimed it at the man assaulting the officer, and ordered him to stop. He said, uh, the, gentleman, the guy who was beating on the cop was named Anderson. So Anderson stopped attacking and sprinted away. The officers from nearby agencies... Uh, showed up. The cops say that uh, Derek Meyer did a good job. They appreciate it. Don't know what would have happened. They said he probably saved someone's life. Maybe the officer's life or maybe the other guy's life, Anderson. Because you start waiting on a, a police officer and he or she is probably going to shoot you. Just the way it is. Might be an object lesson. Don't go wailing on a police officer. Okay? Kind of Serious stuff. Simple at the same time. Uh, let's see. Uh, 866 Talk Gun. Uh, line three, Philip, traveling in Kansas. Hey, Philip, you're on Gun Talk. Uh, yes, sir. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, you bet. A couple of years ago, I was running for office, basically trying to take care of some of the situation that, you know, with all these uh, rights that the government continues to try and fringe on. 
during that time, I actually started receiving death threats. So Ooh. I started carrying a firearm with me and was, had the intention of actually getting a concealed carry, even mm-hmm. though constitutionally we don't need one. Okay. Well, before I was able to get it, I had a, a guy who, I don't know what I did, but I angered him, and he uh, started taking his road rage out on me. Mm. Well, I actually pulled the firearm out uh, of the case. I had, okay, I'm an over-the-road truck driver, and mm-hmm. I had my firearm in my uh, bunk of my truck. Okay. Well, I had to hit the brakes hard enough several times that it wound up flying to the front. I reached over, picked it up. Showed it to him, and he finally went away, which mm-hmm. was my enti- entire int- intent at that point. Well, I wound up getting uh, the police called on me, and police pulled me over, asked if I had a firearm. I was honest with them, told I did. One thing leads to another, I wound up getting arrested. Mm-hmm. Because Ohio has a law that says you cannot have a loaded firearm in your vehicle unless you have a permit. Mm-hmm. Okay. I've been dealing with this for two years. I wound up uh, getting to court uh, about three weeks ago, and the judge tells me that not only do I not have the right to a firearm, that I needed punished for my views on the Second Amendment. <laughs> wait, wait, what? He's, this is actually the, the judge said exactly that? Uh, to the best of my recollection, that was what he said. Said so you need to be punished for your views on the Second Amendment? Actually, he said uh, it was more to my adamant defense of the Second Amendment. I believe okay. is what his words were. <laughs> okay. Well, let me ask you a question. Did you testify in court? Uh, yes, I did. I mean, uh, we didn't actually go to trial, you know, a jury trial. We just, you know, we're trying to deal with it through the uh, court system itself. Okay. And I want I want to get bad advice from my uh, lawyer from what I can think Yeah, I, I, mean, uh, that's, I was going to go there for sure. I think I think you got a bad lawyer. I think, and then you, and I'm also going to say you made a bunch of mistakes on the front end on this. There, you know that, right? Well, I realize that now. I mean, uh, you know, I, I should have been the one to uh, call the police first, but at that point, I was too busy trying to keep from running over this person who was angry to even try to look away at the phone. Okay, I mean, even going beyond that. Showing someone your gun is a bad idea, period. This is why I keep telling people you must go get real firearms self-defense training. They would teach you never show your gun to someone. It's, it's just not something you're trying to scare somebody with. The only time they should see it is when you are you know, in fear for your life and you may be shooting them. But, but let's put that aside for the moment. So where are we now? I mean, what's going on? Well... Right now, I am looking at an appeal to this case, but they're they're talking ten thousand dollars for an appeal, yep. and I made thirty seven thousand dollars last year. That's four months of pay for me. <laughs> I, I I understand, but that's you know when you choose to play the game, which is self defense with a gun and waving it around to scare people, that's the cost of entry. That's what it costs to play this game. I'm well, sorry, I, I, and, and I, I, I wasn't. I wasn't trying to scare him. I was trying to get him to go away. I mean, you, know, you were you were uh, trying to the, frighten the, him to make him go away. Come on, don't don't play games with me with words. That's what was going well, on. You were going to show him the gun to say, "I've got a gun. You need to leave." In other words, you better be afraid of me. I, I get what what happened here, but you failed on several you know points. But one of them that you already know, which is it is a, and I've said this over and over and over again, it's a race to the phone. The first person who calls the police gets to be the victim. The only other role that's left is the bad guy. You didn't get there first. Right. Okay. If you have to pull your gun, you call the police. If you never have to uh, pull the trigger, you call the police. If somebody tries road rage on you, you call the police. First person who calls is the good guy. That's the way it works. So I, I don't know what I can do to help you at this point. I mean, yeah, you got a crummy lawyer, and I think you got uh, shafted on the deal. And uh, the, here's the problem: if you if you get a full on felony conviction, you'll never be able to own a gun again. So you got to figure out what you can do with this thing. I, I wish you luck with it. Uh, when we come back, thank you for the call. When we come back, I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, what we can all learn from Phillips' uh, travails here. There's a lot. 
for us to know. And once again, it's that old deal of what you don't know really can hurt you. 866-TALK-GUN. Crimson Trace announces LaserGuard Pro, designed for today's most popular concealed carry firearms. Combining a red or green laser sight with 150 lumen light and featuring instinctive activation, LaserGuard Pro takes personal defense to the next level. Available now for the Smith & Wesson Shield. Visit CrimsonTrace.com to find a dealer near you and to learn more about why Crimson Trace is making laser sights standard equipment. If you're like me, you don't have money to burn, but you still want to buy guns, ammo, and accessories. That's why we created Gun Delio. That's a free, yes, a free smartphone app. Just download it and start getting the deals. Could be discounts, offers of free magazines for your gun, or you could be the first to hear about new stuff from gun makers. Here's how it works. With Gun Delio on your phone, you get alerts when you enter a gun store. Special deals, you know. You don't have to do a thing. It'll do a lot of other cool things, like let you watch gun videos and listen to Gun Talk podcast. Plus, check it anytime for hundreds of deals and offers. Getting more while spending less. Smart, huh? Gun Delio. Made in America. Gluten-free at the App Store and Google Play or GunDealio.com. For 36 years, the U.S. Sportsmen's Alliance has been fighting to protect hunting, fishing, and trapping for sportsmen from coast to coast. Today, we are under constant attack from extremist animal rights groups who want to end your ability to hunt in the U.S. Join us to protect our sporting heritage and our way of life outdoors. To join or for more information on how you can help, go to USSportsmen.org. That's USSportsman.org. Brownells has gone retro. Check out Brownells' new line of retro AR-15 and AR-style 308 rifles at brownells.com slash retro. Whether you're looking for Eugene Stoner's original 308 design, the famous M16A1, Air Force 601, or the XM-177 carbine, Brownells has the classic, new production, old-school rifle of your dreams. Own the firearm you used in basic training, carried in service, or that Grandpa always talks about. See more at brownells.com slash retro. With you here. I uh, got an email from Jeff. It says, uh, took your advice on the Blink camera system. Thought you might like to see the attached clip of a fox on my front porch from 4 o'clock this morning. Uh, so he sends me this video. This fox is just standing there. And I mean, we're not talking about out in the yard. It's on the front porch, this thing. It's kind of one of the fun things you get to do with the uh, Blink cameras. And yeah, they're security cameras. And yes, you know, they'll alert you when people are around your house or have broken into your house. They'll also alert you when somebody drops off a package so you know it's there. But, and I'm, I've talked about this before, it also lets you see what's out there like foxes, raccoons, deer, whatever's out there, neighbor's kids who, who stole the uh, the wheelbarrow. You know, that's uh, the kind of thing the Blink camera will do for you. It's real easy to set up. It works off of your internet. Uh, it sends notifications to your phone let you know, you know, it's got motion detection, let you know when there's movement there. You can also just tap into it anytime you want to, just to see each of the cameras. You can set up multiple cameras around. They're, they're real small. They're easy to set up. It's, uh, and the guys at Blink, they say, look, there's, uh, you get three of their cameras for what the other guys charge for one. And you get an extra 10% off with the Gun Talk code. All you have to do is go to blinkprotect.com slash gun talk on the web, blinkprotect.com slash gun talk. When you go there, Type gun talk, all one word, upper or lowercase, in the discount field at checkout. You get an extra 10% off. Blinkprotect.com slash gun talk. Philip called in just a minute ago, and uh, he's in a pickle. Truck driver. Somebody tries to cut him off, road rage thing. So he slammed on his brakes. This gun he's got in the cab is flying around the cab. He picks up the gun. He waves at this guy to scare him off. The guy drives away, but then police, the guy calls the police and says, hey, there's a crazy truck driver out there. He's got a gun. What do you think the police are going to do? They're going to go look for the guy with a gun. Whereas he could have called and said, there's a crazy guy 
who just, you know, tried to run me off the road. And uh, I finally had to uh, pull my gun out just to keep him off of me. And then he took off. And here's you know, the car and the model and all the rest of it. And now they're looking for the other guy. I have said this over and over again. And it's borne out in real world all the time. When something happens, it is a race to the phone. And, and, and it may be you're thinking, oh, that's not a big thing. Yeah, some guy came up, and I had to tell him, you know, get out of here, leave me alone. He's panhandling, he's aggressive or something. Call the police. They want you to call them. Because this jackass may call the police and say, hey, there's some crazy dude out there, man. I sort of went up and asked him the time, and he's all over me. Now they're looking for you. If something happens, call the police. Make a report. Just call it in. Get your story in. It, it is truly a race. And now Philip's in a, a tough place. The other thing, and let's talk about the practicality here. If you got a gun bouncing around the cab of your truck, you got a problem. It needs to be on your hip. And he said he didn't have a carry permit because uh, it's his constitutional right. <sighs> How's that working out for you? You could argue it's your constitutional right all you want to. And it is. But the reality is, without the permit, you're not wearing it. If you're not wearing it, it's bouncing around. If you're not wearing it, you don't get any training. If you're not wearing it, it's not available to you when you get out. I just don't get it. And, yes, I understand. Say, well, I shouldn't have to do that. I understand that. There's a whole bunch of the stuff as grown-ups that we say we shouldn't have to do that we have to do. And we can resent it all we want to, and we can say we shouldn't have to do it, but the reality is, when you're grown up, you got to deal with stuff like that. And then he go, you know, he gets a lawyer who's God, sounds like he let Philip talk to the judge about the Second Amendment and it's my right and yada yada yada. Instead of just telling him shut up, don't say a word, answer these questions as in the shortest possible manner. Don't go off on your beliefs or anything else. A lawyer who would let you talk like that, well, you know, there's a bell curve and everything. The, uh, what do they say, the person who finishes last in class, the lowest uh, grade point average in the class, they still call him a lawyer. So there it is. Oh, my goodness. Uh, let's see. Chuck is on line two, Garland, Texas. Chuck, you got a problem, Carrie. What's going on here? Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, I've been carrying concealed probably 10 or 12 years. Uh, started out with a belly bag. And I kind of like it. It's had some weird stuff to do in that, too. And you, listening to you, convinced me not to do that to get a uh, holster, proper right. holster. So I bought a Super Tuck Deluxe okay. and one of their belts. And I carry about 5 o'clock, you know, inside waistband, right hip. Mm -hmm. um, after doing this for several years, five, six, seven years, I've noticed that I have, like, a permanent discomfort deep down inside my hip. And it's I can feel it, especially if I lay on my right side when I'm trying to sleep. And I don't I can't, you know, definitely connect the two. But mm -hmm. it sure makes me wonder. I'm just wondering if you've ever heard anybody go on about uh, inside the waistband causing them pain. Yeah. I mean, I, and I will tell you, I, I've had it happen where a, a 1911 in certain holsters and I had to move it from like a five o'clock to a four o'clock to find the position that works for me. You just have to shift things around and try different things because it's not, you know, there's no one solution that works for everybody. But if, if a particular mode of carry is causing you pain, change it to something else, particularly if it's a back pain or something like that. But yeah, and contact the guys at Crossbreed Holsters. They may have some ideas that can help you out. They're good folks there. 866 Talk Gun. Six six talk gun. Uh, we were just talking with uh, Philip, who's got himself into a real pickle. Uh, got arrested. Uh, basically, brandishing is the term a gun when somebody is engaging in road rage, and he ran him off by flashing his gun at him. But then the police came up for him, and now he's looking at a felony conviction. Uh, Scott wants to talk about uh, Second Amendment. Line three out of Savannah, Georgia. Hey, Scott. Hey, how you doing today? Great. 
great. Hey, I was uh, just riding back actually from our uh, our property lease there, where we do a little hunting in uh, in Georgia there, and, and listening to this call, and and I kind of cringe. I just wanted to kind of get your thoughts about you know Second Amendment. It, it's it's a right, but is it an absolute? And, and how you feel about you know. Uh, you know, maybe a requirement. I mean, it seems like a good idea to maybe have a requirement that somebody go through some type of gun training before they're even allowed to own a gun. I mean, I've been a gun, gun owner my whole life, a hunter. I have no issue with it. I know some people are more fanatical mm-hmm. about it or can't infringe on the right or require mm-hmm. that. But it just seems like if uh, if this gentleman, Philip, would have had some prior training mm-hmm. uh, before he was allowed to, to own that gun, that, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, I, common I, sense training. I, I, I agree. Some, some training would help. Here, here's the problem, and I throw this out back to you for your consideration, Scott. Um, there are powerful forces who would like for us to not own any guns, period. Right. They are the ones who are calling for mandatory training. Therefore, if they said, okay, well, you got to have two hours of training, you go, yeah, okay, that's a pain. Uh, I'm sorry, it's got to be eight hours of training. I'm sorry, it's got to be 40 hours of training. It's got to be 40 hours of training, and you have to have a million-dollar liability. Oh, yeah, and you're also going to have to have a psychologist or psychiatrist sign off to say that you're mentally uh, stable and you'll never hurt anyone. And without that, you can't own a gun. All, By the way, all of those have been proposed. Right. So no, I, the, I, I, uh, I completely see both sides of it. Again, I'm a lifetime gun owner. Uh, I teach my children you know, about guns, and, mm-hmm. and they spend a lot of time with me before they're even allowed to to fire the gun, um, but it just seems like to me somewhere's got to be somewhere in the middle that, you know, well, not, me, to, not, to me, bash, not to bash Philip, but to say that, you yeah. know, that's what makes the rest of us look a little, uh, you know, uh, scary is, is that there are people who are buying guns rational enough to know exactly when you're supposed to pull it out. Like you well, said, the whole, well, for, the whole I, rule I, behind I, concealed, sure. concealed carry is don't let it be seen. And I guess I would offer that yes, the question, the answer to the question is yes. Most people who buy guns are absolutely rational enough. Uh, accidental gunshot deaths are way down. Murders are way down. Gun crimes are down by half. So we have basically ripped the guts out of gun crime and accidents and the rest of it. So we're doing really good things. It's just that we want to you know, attack it everywhere we can and try to do better and better. At the same time, not giving those who want to destroy us, our culture, our way of life, and our Second Amendment, right. the rope with which to hang us. And when you simply don't trust someone even slightly, you're not likely to want to give them an inch knowing that you never get it back. And that's always been the history. So, uh, I, I, And I always throw this out. Consider this. Would you do the same thing for the First Amendment? Because if you wouldn't do it for the First Amendment, you shouldn't do it for the Second Amendment. Would you require some kind of government-mandated training before you can exercise your First Amendment free speech rights. Well, of course, we would also, that's ridiculous, wouldn't do that. Well, it's Second Amendment, it's First Amendment. They have the same thing. These are not rights that are granted us or given to us from the government. These are rights that we had before the foundation of this country, and we said, here's a list of those that you have to keep your hands off of. That's what the Bill of Rights is. Hey, I appreciate the call, sir. Thank you. Uh, i tell you what, talk about this. Reciprocity probably would have taken care of this. If we had reciprocity completely around the country, Philip may not have gotten himself in trouble. We've got some reciprocity bills, national reciprocity bills in Congress, but there's a problem. There could be a significant problem. When we come back, we're going to talk to an expert about that and find out what's going on and is maybe do you want to be supporting this reciprocity or maybe not. Coming up. 